I'm so grateful for the invitation to be here with you today and just share some of the exciting developments in the field. And, and I was very grateful to be at the dinner last night and just hear about the profound experiences and passion that's driving the formation of this group. And, and, and thank you to the Taxel family as well. And, um, and just grateful actually to be giving a talk in a room of live people. I think this is, <laughs> this is the first talk I've given that's not through a computer screen. So, um, so I was invited to talk about rare forms of head and neck cancer. There are a variety of different rare diseases that we treat uh, in the head and neck discipline. But I thought I'd focus on the salivary gland cancers uh, and something hopefully is um, an area that maybe you don't know very much about. And so in terms of a disease, these are the tumors that arise in the major salivary glands, like the parotid gland, the submandibular gland, the sublingual gland. But also what you may not realize is that minor salivary glands exist all throughout the upper area digestive tract. So these are microscopic glands that exist all throughout your tongue, your throat, your sinuses. So you can get salivary gland cancers in all of these areas. And so sometimes, you know, you'll get a biopsy of a tumor in these areas and surprisingly it comes back as some kind of salivary gland cancer. So when I joined the faculty at Memorial in 2009, um, I sat down with the chief of head and neck and I asked him what he wanted me to focus on. And he said, I want you to focus on salivary gland cancers, which I knew nothing about. Um, and so these are my disclosures. I went and looked and this is the list of salivary cancers, okay? So this is less than 5% of all head and neck malignancies. The incidence of these uh, tumors are well less than 3,000 per year. And then on top of that, if you really were to look, histologically, there's not one salivary gland cancer, but over 20 different subtypes. So when you're a young junior investigator and trying to figure out what are we gonna do here, where do you start with this list, right? And so where we did decide to start were in two diseases, adenoid cystic carcinoma, uh, and salivary duct carcinomas, primarily because these were the ones that we saw most often. And then when you started looking through the literature, as, we, as you heard, we want to do personalized medicine. We want to develop therapies that are specific to the molecular profiles of these diseases. And you looked into the biology of these tumors, and you really couldn't find anything. Okay, there was very little known. So what are you going to do? So what we had to do was we had to partner up with friends. And so as a clinical researcher, you know, all of this uh, all of these, um, the development of these clinical trial concepts, et cetera, really came through collaborations with laboratory investigators. And so at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, I have a close collaboration with Luke Morris, who's a head and neck surgeon, uh, but also uh, a, 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 um, uh, a specialist in the laboratory that looks at the immunogenomic profiles of different tumors. And he became more interested in understanding the genomic landscape of all of these diseases. And so by example, the first where he started with adenoid cystic carcinoma on the left and salivary duct carcinomas on the right, these oncoprints represents the genetic alterations found in both of these diseases. And what's impor important and interesting to kind of point out is that clinically these diseases are very different. So while they all can, both can metastasize very frequently and become incurable, Adenocystic carcinomas can be defined by indolent slow progression, whereas salivary duct carcinomas are much more aggressive. They can grow very rapidly. They can metastasize the brain more frequently. And those clinical distinctions also are reflected in the genomic landscape of the tumors, which were over very distinct. On the left, adenocystic carcinomas, overall, if you took the 10,000 foot view, you, you found out that this is a very low mutational burden tumor. Not many genetic alterations are seen, and hence the ability to target specific genes is really not uh, very accessible. Salivary duct carcinomas, on the other hand, had more mutations, and not only that, but many more mutations that one could consider as therapeutic targets. So of course, one's approaches for developing clinical trials and new treatments would be quite different. So our efforts in the program at Memorial, and at the time that we were starting to do this, we had never done a trial in salivary gland cancers. The feasibility of doing these trials were often questioned. Um, and so we decided to start with adenoid cystic carcinomas just because there were more patients there. And one of the findings when I started on the faculty was in Europe, they had identified these mib mib n l one translocations. And so this is an oncogene or transcription factor that is activated in uh, T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemias, overexpressed in colon cancers and breast cancers. And one of the themes that, that comes out here is that when you're dealing with rare diseases where the biology is not really clear, we have to extrapolate from other more common diseases to develop these treatments. So 
in one kind of loose way that we decided that we would do a rationalized approach was targeting the downstream effects of MIB because this was highly expressed in these tumors. And one of those uh, pathways was uh, relevant to a class of drugs known as the VEGFR uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. All right. Uh, yeah. So many of you in the audience are familiar with these class of drugs. These have been approved in thyroid cancers and kidney cancers. One of the primary things it targets is VEGFR, which is involved in the an angiogenesis of these tumors or the formation of blood vessels. But in truth, these are dirty drugs. They target a lot of different proteins, many of which were thought to be downstream of MIB. So one of the clinical trials that we first started with was a drug called Exitinib that hit VEGFR 1 through 3, KIT, PDGFR, among other receptor tyrosine kinases. And the other reason we were interested in this drug was because in initial phase 1 trial, if you look through the phase 1 results, there was one line in that article that said that there was one ACC responder in that trial. So we convinced um, uh, the company to give us this drug for, the, for this uh, trial based upon just that one responder. And actually, this was a negative study in that it didn't meet the major response rate that we were looking for. But this waterfall plot that Richard had also shown, so each one of these bars represents a, an individual patient and their best response. So if you're below the bar, the axis, x axis, you had a tumor regression. If you're above it, your tumor grew as best response. So you can see that the, the major response rate here was 9%. But the vast majority of patients actually had some degree of tumor regression, leading us to think, at least as a class, perhaps, there was activity with this drug. Now, because we originally thought that this was going to be dependent upon MIB activation, we also looked retrospectively in our tissues to see, OK, was um, the, the tumor control rate related to the MIB status of the tumor? And unfortunately, this was not. So even though the biologic rationale was loose, ultimately, we found some activity with this drug in this initial phase 2 trial. A subset of those patients went on to get genomic sequencing. So uh, we have a next generation sequencing platform, a memorial that we use for our patients. And among the 11 patients we saw, we, we found out that um, there was a pretty significant enrichment for patients with this 4Q12 amplicon. And the reason why that's important is because this amplicon includes the genes PDGRF, KDR, and KIT, the very same targets in which uh, Exitinib um, uh, blocks. And so you might imagine that patients with this amplicon may have, you know, outsized benefit to these VEGFR TKIs. And indeed, that's what we found as an example. This was a patient, and adenoid cystic carcinomas commonly occur in salivary cancers, but they can also arise in other organs. And this patient had a primary lung adenoid carcinoma and had this 4Q12 amplicon that was 14-fold higher expressed. And you can see we had a dramatic regression in those patients. But as I said, we wanted to improve upon that activity. And so we started cycling through different TKIs. And the next study we did was regorafenib, which again has a lot of the same targets that Exitinib had, but also had inhibition of FGFR, which was posited to be a very important uh, target in adenoid cystic carcinomas. And when we looked, and the, the swimmer plot, again, each one of these bars is the individual patient. As you go out more to the right, these are patients that were on study for longer and had longer term benefit. Among uh, the two out of the three patients who were on treatment the longest also had these 4Q12 amplifications. And the one patient above that was on it for a short time had to come off for toxicity, but already had a 14% regression after two weeks of treatment. So again, another proof of principle that the t another TKI had some activity and that perhaps expression of the actual targets of the drug uh, may have had outside benefit. The last, and, and the other lesson from this study is, of course, as we were cycling through and doing more clinical trials, we started using these drugs in patients who had previously progressed on other TKIs. And one of the lessons learned from this trial, um, as has been seen and observed in kidney cancer and thyroid cancer, is that even though these drugs have shared targets, you can still get regressions despite progression on prior uh, TKIs. And so using these things in sequence may be a viable approach. And the very last TKI study was actually the one that was positive, was a drug called lumbatinib. So lumbatinib, uh, again, inhibits many of the same targets that we've been discussing, and met its primary endpoint with only a 15% partial response rate and a median event-free survival of 8.2 months. But again, you can see, but from the waterfall plot, the majority of patients had tumor regressions. But just to show you where the bar is and the, the lack of developmental therapeutics, this alone 
in addition to an Italian study that was done that replicated these results, led to the NCCN compendium approval of these treatments so that patients could get access to lymphatin. And indeed, this is something that's being used off-label commonly for adenoid cystic carcinomas. But we have to do better than this because these are dirty drugs. We want to personalize the approaches. We want to hit specific molecular targets that are going to make a meaningful difference. I'm sorry, before I get to that, I should mention that all of these were single arm phase two trials, so only one arm, no randomizations as, as you saw in Dr. Carvajal's um, uh, presentation. But a group in South Korea took the phase two exitinib trial data I, I showed you and decided, you know what, there was enough regression there and activity to warrant a randomized comparison. And indeed, to date, the only randomized trial that's been done in adenoid cystic carcinomas was this one done in South Korea, where they randomized patients either to observation, no treatment, just watching, versus exitinib and demonstrate a progression-free survival advantage in that setting. So as we're kind of inching forward uh, from doing proof of principle phase two trials, now with the idea that we've got enough patients, we, we have the feasibility to do these studies, we have the opportunity to do more randomized comparisons to really better delineate the clinical benefit that we're seeing. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion for the TKIs, what we know now is that this class does have some activity. We have to manage the toxicities of these drugs to balance the risks and benefits of those approaches, but truly the the mechanism by which these therapies work is not known. So there's some limitations here about how we move this field forward without understanding the biologic mechanisms, whether combinations or biomarker and rich strategies are really going to be viable is really hard to, uh, is really hard to, to delineate. And so still in adenoid cystic carcinomas, we're trying to find different ways to, as I mentioned, personalize our approaches, target specific molecular alterations, and make this more selective and personalized for patient care. Now, when I showed you the original Oncoprint for ACC, I mentioned the fact that there is a low burden of mutations and that many of the mutations we observed don't really have drugs that match to it. Well, it turns out that that wasn't entirely correct. So this, this is actually an important lesson in terms of the type of profiling we're doing and the tissues that we're using. So the original genomic profile were done all in surgical specimens. And the reason why that's important is because many of those are curative intent patients. So a good percentage of those patients had their primary surgery, uh, primary tumors resected, and they were cured of their disease. And in that population, this notch pathway was mutated at a very low frequency. But when we started to do, do genomic profiling of patients with metastatic disease, the incurable kind, and of course, the patient population relevant for our drug treatments, what we found was a huge enrichment of notch mutations. Up to over 25% of patients in that setting would have uh, a notch 1, 2, 3, or 4 mutation. And this is a therapeutic target. And so what that illustrates is that because notch is associated with aggressive disease, we missed the fact that it was a frequent and possible therapeutic target when analyzing tumors from the curable patient population. And so it's just a, a plug that, you know, when we do profiling, it's not only that we do profiling as many patients as possible, but it's important to match that profiling to the tumor stage in which you are developing your therapeutics. So it turns out that MD Anderson was the first to identify that these notch mutations correlated to poor survival and aggressive disease. So as I said, there's a subset of ACCs that you can just watch and are slowly uh, growing. But patients with these notch mutations, it's a different a different situation. These patients have very rapidly progressive disease and indeed need treatment uh, right away. And our own efforts demonstrated that, as I mentioned, about a quarter of these patients will have activating notch mutations. The good news, of course, is, and the reason why this is a focus, is because these are targetable alterations, okay? So uh, notch is a receptor, uh, receptor, uh, uh, is a receptor at the plasma membrane. But in order to be activated, it must be cleaved by an enzyme called gamma secretase so that the C-terminal part of it then translocates into the nucleus and does its protumorigenic work. And so there's a class of drug called gamma secretase inhibitors that block the activation of NOTCH through that mechanism. These were a class of drugs that were developed more than 15 years ago um, in, in primarily in GI malignancies, but had to be discontinued because of toxicity. And so this was then brought back to be tested in adenoid cystic carcinomas, specifically in those that have these notch mutations. So this was the first kind of um, uh, enrichment for a molecular alteration and a targeted therapy. So this was a trial run by Ayala that we helped uh, lead. 
where we tested AL101, which was the gamma secretase inhibitor at two dose levels, in patients with notch mutant adenoid cystic carcinoma, and we were looking for major responses in these, in these patients. So here's the waterfall plot that was shared a couple of years ago about the four milligram dose level. As you can see with this targeted approach, it was a very nice proof of principle that for a subset of patients with these notch mutations, gamma secretase inhibition can be effective for shrinking tumors. And indeed, the major response rate ultimately was about 15% uh, observed in this, in this cohort. The problem was, though, is that these responses were not very durable and patients could start uh, progressing rapidly after the tumors had initially shrank. But just to kind of give you a sense of the degree of regression that we see, and again, uh, similar to uvular melanoma, these notch mutant ACCs have a potential, uh, have a particular tropism for the liver. And you can see these, this big time liver disease with dramatic regressions with gamma secretase inhibition in several of these patients. So the trial demonstrates activity with the drug, um, patients benefited, but the overall progression-free survival, the durability of that benefit was short. And so we need to really take this as a proof of principle that the notch mutations are actually targetable and relevant therapeutic targets for these patients, but innovate new combinations or new therapies to optimize the efficacy that we're seeing. So just to kind of summarize the end of the ACC section, I just wanted to kind of list out from the time that we started where there were virtually no clinical trials, the amount of research activity that's developed over the last 10, year has, 10 years has been quite extraordinary. Because of the genomic profiling and our better understanding of the targets that exist in the disease, as well as interest from other researchers once seeing that uh, doing phase two trials were quite feasible, there's a robust amount of research going on in the field looking more at TKIs, mid-targeted approaches. There are a couple of companies now developing notch inhibitors as well. Uh, researchers have looked at the MDM2 inhibition in these tumors because, in fact, most of these are P53 wild type uh, uh, tumors. Epigenetics is a huge uh, black hole for adenoid cystic carcinoma. Many of the alterations that do exist are in epigenetic uh, pathways uh, for which we don't know how to really optimally inhibit. And of course, there are a variety of immunotherapy approaches that are being tested. And at the end, I'll kind of circle back to that and uh, give you an update of where that's at. So salivary duct carcinoma, as I mentioned, is completely different, okay? Um, if you took away, uh, if you just looked at the genomic signature, almost two-thirds of these patients would have a mutation in a pathway or a gene that matches to a drug, okay? So from a medical oncologist's perspective, it's in a very exciting area because there's so many different opportunities to innovate new therapies. But the most common target in these tumors is the angin receptor, okay? So that's highlighted up here. It's not down here because it's not mutated. It's simply expressed, it's present, okay? And so this is the receptor that transduces signals from testosterone and exerts the effects of testosterone. And it's also the target that's relevant for the hormonal therapies that developed in prostate cancer, okay? So over 70% of satelloid duct carcinomas will have high expression of and receptor, which makes you think, okay, well, maybe it's being driven by the AR gene in ways similar to prostate cancer. So another lesson here is, you know, where we have limited biology, we again have to extrapolate from the common diseases. So would approaches inhibiting AR as we use in prostate cancer be applicable? And then when you look more closely at the biology of these tumors, and this is again work from Luke Morris's group, when, they, when we found, when, when we and others identified that AR was expressed, is it ex simply expressed or is it actually functional? Is it actually signaling biologically in the way uh, that one would expect? And the bottom line from the right-hand side is a transcriptional gene expression uh, experiment demonstrating that in tumors with high AR present, they could also correlate that to high uh, gene expression outputs for the AR pathway, meaning that it's actually actively signaling these tumors. So that, again, gives you a little bit more confidence that maybe AR-targeted approaches would be uh, relevant. And then when you took a closer look at the genomic profile, a lot of the mutations that have been described in prostate cancer are it, that uh, interact with the androgen receptor signaling pathway are also present. And then very lastly, there are different AR splice variants that have been described in prostate cancer that are also present, and the relevance of which to therapeutics is, is being debated. So there, up to this point, there have been a variety of different case reports where people just off-label were treating patients with uh, different therapies to target AR. 
Those include androgen deprivation, so these are GnRH agonists or antagonists that decrease circulating testosterone levels, or direct antiandrogens like uh, that specifically bind the receptor and block its activity, or combined androgen blockade as was tested in this initial phase two trial where you took androgen deprivation and the antiandrogen together and saw what happened. So this was a very noteworthy study because this was the first salivary carcinoma study that was dedicated study that was done. It was performed in Japan where they took patients with uh, recurrent metastatic salivary carcinomas and just treated them with hormonal therapy, androgen deprivation therapy plus uh, bicalutamide. And as you can see from the waterfall plot now, very uh, potent and, uh, uh, and dur durable regressions achieved just with this hormonal therapy approach with a response rate of about over 40%. And as you can see here illustrating sometimes the significant regressions that you could see. This is a patient with a parotid tumor that was kind of um, uh, breaking through the skin that had a dramatic effect on the hormonal therapy. And in many ways, this was fantastic because it, it was the first uh, SDC study that was done, but also verified that what was being reported in clinical case reports was actually true and gave us a number to shoot for in terms of efficacy. An ongoing study that uh, through that same ERKI uh, development group that Dr. Carvajal mentioned that was developed and is ongoing in Europe is to look at this targeted approach in the first line setting and compare it to chemotherapy. So while we don't really have a lot of data with chemotherapy, chemotherapy still remains the default standard option. And so it'll be interesting to see if the activity that we see with hormonal therapy really matches that of chemotherapy in this, in this age group. Here in the US, actually under Dr. Schwartz's leadership, we conducted the first US salivary carcinoma study uh, we were evaluating a second generation antiandrogen known as enzalutamide. And there's several differences be between our study and the Japanese study. One, this we used a, this enzalutamide uh, compound that has a few mechanistic advantages that allow for more potent inhibition of the pathway. And two, we also did this without androgen deprivation. So the, the, when you lower testosterone with androgen deprivation therapy, there are a variety of different side effects that come with it. And given the more potent action at AR, uh, we felt that uh, we wanted to test the monotherapy activity of benzalutamide. And then lastly, we allowed not only patients who had never been treated with hormonal therapy, but we also allowed a subset of patients who had received prior AR therapy, primarily because enzalutamide was first approved in castration-resistant prostate cancer, showing the ability to overcome resistance to prior, uh, to prior uh, uh, combined angina blockade. And so far by the waterfall plot, again, you can see the proof of principle that with monotherapy enzalutamide, you can cause regressions. And we ultimately had seven major responses, but the problem was they weren't durable. Only two of those seven were durable, so giving us a low response rate of 4%. So many of the differences here illustrate that you know, the, the uh, profile of the cohort of patients you're treating are quite important. Um, but the but the clinical and scientific lesson from this is that the androgen deprivation is actually a key component of activity to, the, to, these, uh, to these approaches. Now, having said that, even among the 13 patients who had previously progressed on AR-targeted therapies still had tumor regressions, including an unconfirmed partial response. So it also gave the important lesson that there's still AR dependence in these tumors, despite the fact that they had uh, progressed on prior therapy. But, what was missing from all of this um, is, you know, we're doing trials, we're finding signals, we're doing proof of principles. Um, but as met, people men, uh, mentioned, biospecimens are scarce, and really there are a lack of models in these diseases. So we really need the opportunity to do trials that not only interrogate clinical endpoints, but also make a, a concerted effort to do biologic studies so that we're not inform only informed by the clinical results of those trials, but the biologic findings would also lead us to different mechanisms and different approaches to innovate new therapies. So an ongoing study that we're developing uh, through the NCI uh, to be done through the ETCTN network um, is a first-line study taking a third-generation anti-androgen darolutamide and combining it with androgen deprivation blockade and doing a very small study to look at response rates as we have done previously. And the idea here being that combined androgen blockade with darolutamide would be superior to the bicalutamide results seen in Japan. But incorporated into this are theranostic scans, so FDHT PETs, which non-invasively allow us to detect the expression of AR in individual tumors through PET 
technology. And we're using that to really analyze the heterogeneity of AR expression within tumors, as well as to uh, document the engagement of AR uh, with darolutamide. And secondly, we're doing serial biopsies to really interrogate what is happening with the AR pathway and other uh, parallel signaling pathways so that we can better understand what are the mechanisms of susceptibility and resistance to these approaches. So moving on from AR, the other top target here, and there are multiple of them, as I mentioned, is, uh, is a gene uh, product called HER2. And HER2, of course, is um, of uh, particular in interest because it's, it's altered in breast cancers and gastric cancers, and there are a whole family of therapeutics that have been developed against HER2. And again, extrapolating from more common diseases, the approach is if we could take HER2 positive amplified and overexpressed salivary duct carcinomas and treat them with these approaches, would those be effective? So again, um, here are a list of some of the data that's been generated in HER2-directed therapies, many of which have come in small pilots, baskets of other trials. But the main one, again, was from the same Japanese group that did the AR therapy study. They had done a full phase two evaluating trastuzumab, which is an, a, a monoclonal antibody targeting HER2 activity approved in breast and gastric cancer in combination with chemotherapy, in this case, docetaxel and antimitotic. And in 57 patients saw a remarkable response rate of 70% with a median progression-free survival of 8.9 months. And then we and others had done smaller pilots looking at other HER2 target strategies, which, which I'll cover. But this particular one was a, was a basket study done uh, with a salivary cancer basket looking at trastuzumab or pertuzumab, two antibodies targeting HER2 without any chemotherapy, showing also a pretty high response rate among 15 patients but also a, a relatively high rate of progression uh, as best response in those, in those patients. And so the, the, um, the argument about whether chemotherapy is needed or not needed remains, uh, remains an open question. At Memorial Sloan Kettering, Bob Lee uh, at our center had a basket study for this compound, adotrastuzumab and tansin, or what we, what we refer to as TDM1. And so this is what we call an antibody-dependent uh, conjugate where it takes trastuzumab, that's the antibody on the right, so that's what hones this, this agent to HER2 positive tumor cells, and it's linked um, through, uh, through a bond to DM1, which is a cytotoxic moiety. It's an antimitotic. So the idea here is that the antibody hones the ADC to HER2 positive tumor cells. It gets endocytosed, it gets proteolytically degraded, and then that chemotherapy is, has been selectively delivered to that cell to kill that cell. And again, this has been approved in uh, HER2-positive breast cancers that have progressed on other HER2-directed therapies. So a couple years ago at ASCO, Bob had looked at the results from our salivary cancer cohort and, and found a really high rate of response of metabolic and resist structural response of about 90% and a progression-free survival that had not been met in the first 10 patients. And this is a, 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 a therapeutic we're, uh, we're still uh, evaluating. And indeed, since this time, other ADCs targeting HER2 have also reported little bits of data demonstrating good activity. So when thinking through uh, another national trial for this disease and wanting to test and to develop the first HER2-directed um, randomized trial in, in the US for this uh, comparison. Because the Japanese had established really good historical data with the docetaxel trastuzumab combination, we decided to compare this to TDM1. Conceptually, there was a nice, um, uh, there was a nice parallels because both approaches combined HER2 inhibition with an antimitotic, although obviously the TDM1 does it in a linked manner and delivering in a more selective way in the ideas which one of these approaches would be better. So, so through the NRG, we're, we're, we're developing and almost uh, ready to activate uh, a national trial where we're taking patients with recurrent metastatic HER2 positive salivary gland cancers, randomizing them one to one and getting docetaxel trastuzumab versus TDM1 and comparing the disease control rates between these two with the idea that TDM1, because of its more superior safety profile and other mechanistic effects, 
will have a superior outcome. And those that progress in each arm will then be free to uh, cross over to the other. So this would be the first US trial for, for this disease entity and also the first randomized comparison uh, based upon the success that, uh, that the Japanese groups have uh, already reported. So just moving on to, you know, touch upon this last bit uh, uh, target, it, it's hard to talk about salvagelin cancer and targeted therapies and not mention TRAC. So as many of you know, uh, NTRAC alterations or fusions occur in a variety of different malignancies, uh, but they happen very commonly in salvagelin cancers and specifically in a subtype of salvagelin cancers called secretary carcinomas. So this is another example where you take a rare disease and you take a rare subset of that rare disease and you find an alteration that's relevant for therapeutic, uh, and you might wonder to yourself, well, what's, what's, what's the worth of doing that? But in fact, for those individual patients with track rearranged salvage gland cancers, this resulted in the discovery of a very effective therapeutic. So this is uh, from the larotrectinib trial. And indeed, when you look at the overall responses achieved with larotrectinib across different histologies, and you look at salvage gland cancers in the light purple, there were remarkable responses with uh, larotrectinib um, in these patients, as well as other TRAC inhibitors. So this is just another plug that even for rare, t even more so for rare tumors, the genomic profile and molecular profile is so key and important where you don't have standardized therapy so that you can find rational targets that potentially can make a big difference. So the very last section of this is just to talk about immunotherapy. Um, it's, you know, of course, it's, it's hard not to, it's hard to give a talk on any topic in cancer now and not talk about immunotherapy. Um, but there have been several trials that have been done in salvage gland cancers that are worth mentioning. So this is a chart similar to what Dr. Carvajal showed. So on the x-axis is the number of mutations. And the y-axis is based upon RNA-seq immune deconvolution, the degree of immune cell infiltration, how many immune cells are present. And you can see a lot of the common malignancies represented where they are, melanoma, really high mutational burden and relatively good immune infiltration. And relative to different uh, salvage cancer subtypes, ACC is here on the left lower hand corner, corner, which represents the fact it has very low mutational burden, low immune infiltration, not a great setup for immunotherapy. Whereas salvage duct, again, this heterogeneity between different subtypes, high immune infiltration, and a little bit more mutational burden. And on the right is a chart of PDL1 expression. Again, as you can see, diverse. Adenoid cystic, very low rates. Salvador carcinoma is higher. And just to summarize what this says here is that immune checkpoint blockade studies have been done in adenoid cystic carcinomas or other salvage gland cancers and really shown very, very low response rates. So, you know, we recently, in a piecemeal fashion, have been reporting out our results from Morrison Kettering for a combination of PD-1, CTLA-4 blockade, and recurrent metastatic cell gland cancers. And the way we approached this was separating out ACCs from all other salvage gland cancers, recognizing that there is some unique biologic uh, um, uh, characteristics to ACC, and also recognizing for feasibility's sake, even though we would like to evaluate these immunotherapies in each individual salvage gland cancer subtype, that's just not a feasible uh, approach. So all these patients got ipilimumab and nivolumab, and we uh, were evaluating for best overall response. So here's a waterfall plot from ACC. As you can see from it, a very negative study, okay? Only a few patients with regression. Most patients had either minor growth or progression of disease. Um, but when you looked at these major regressions, these were among the most um, dramatic regressions that you know, we've ever seen in a clinical trial setting. So this is a patient with a sinus-involved tumor with almost a complete response on nevo-epi. Ipi, and then, of course, diffuse lung metastases that also cleared up um, on therapy for uh, almost two years. So it, 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 it gives us a lesson that, yes, immune checkpoint blockade on its own for ACCs is not an effective approach. But it really raises the question is how do we make, how do we leverage these responses and the biology that we see in these clinical trials to make this type of response more accessible to more ACC patients? Now, when you compare that to the non-ACC cohort, just to kind of give you an overview, a little bit more activity, 16% major response rate. You can see some of the regressions over here. But then when you took a closer look at the histologies that were actually um, uh, responding, these were mostly salvage duct carcinomas, 
And so this is the Salverduck data. So if you just took the subset of Salverduck carcinomas, three out of 12 had major responses for durable periods of time. But this was sort of a binary switch. You either responded really well or you had absolutely no response. So while this is, again, maybe a little bit more promising signal than what we see in ACC, uh, we have to say to ourselves, how do we better select for the, the patients on the top of this swimmer's plot and identify those that should get it and those that shouldn't and or innovate better therapies that, so that these approaches are better suited for all patients? We try to do this um, by uh, looking, again, an attempt to better understand the immune tumor microenvironment of these patients by biopsying their tumors. And so as part of the study, we did a baseline uh, biopsy, an on-treatment biopsy to see, A, you know, can we find predictors of response in the patients who benefited, and B, can we understand how the immune TME is actually modulated with immune, with immune checkpoint blockade that would lead us to the next study, okay? So the bottom line is like on the, on the, on the left-hand side here, this heat map depicts that there were the unsupervised hierarchical clustering demonstrated two groups, one that was extremely cold on the left and, with, and on the right a little bit more immune infiltration. We saw differences in immunosuppressive uh, elements, that's MDSCs and M2 macrophages. And then these scores for immune infiltration, as I mentioned, uh, dichotomizes between these two groups. And it turns out that three out of the four responses that we saw in the trial uh, were, and had biopsies uh, were enriched within the slightly higher immune infiltration group. So suggesting that you need some degree of, of baseline immune infiltration to respond. Now in the middle, uh, middle uh, panel and in the right panel, the middle panel is just the profiles of the on-treatment biopsies and the, and the rightmost panel, which you can focus on, is the difference between on treatment and post treatment. And essentially, the responders that we saw were enriched with on, on the left hand part of that panel with really high levels of immune infiltration that were induced by immune checkpoint blockade. So, you know, probably a very simplistic observation here is that immune infiltration at baseline and the induction of that immune infiltration to, to augment it correlates to, to responsiveness. And indeed, one of the things that we're going to, one of the multidimensional problems with immunotherapy that we're going to have to deal with is how do we induce or increase immune infiltration to help these uh, therapies work better. And so one of the ongoing trials that we're doing now is trying to look at different combinations that not only addresses the immune checkpoints in T cells, but also combinations that will allow us to increase the immunostimulatory environment within the TME. This is a well-known combination of lumbatin and pembrolizumab that's FDA approved in several different malignancies now, really targeting the immunosuppressive effects of VEGFR action within the TME and seeing if this uh, would be an effective approach. So ultimately with PD-1, what we know is that targeting PD-1 or even immune checkpoints alone is not enough. But the remarkable responses that we've seen in these patients and these tumors really lead us to think that if we could innovate new ways to uh, broaden the, the benefit of these, of these uh, uh, therapies, that would be of huge benefit to patients. And part of that effort is really going to have to be understanding the heterogeneity of the microenvironments of these patients and better personalizing these approach for these, for these patients. And so many of those approaches are not being tested at our own institution and others. I showed you the anti-VEGFR approach. There are vaccine approaches. There are chemotherapy approaches that are being tested at other institutions as well. And so this is the last slide. I just want to end with final comments is that um, what we've learned through this journey is, and you've demonstrated and you'll hear throughout the, the day is just the feasibility of doing this, the importance of doing these trials, and that now that we've established the feasibility and better understand the biologic approaches, we can really innovate uh, better approach, uh, better treatments and trials for patients uh, that help hopefully will move the ball forward in, in terms of therapeutics. And so this is just my acknowledgement slide for our support and, and all our collaborators. So 